Well, good morning, Heights family. How are we doing? And it is good to see everybody this morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Ryan Myers. I have the joy, honor, and privilege of being the youth pastor here. <laughs> I, love, I love all our students. You guys are incredible. Um, I am so excited about this message. We are just about to start um, our new small group semester. So small groups are starting back up. Youth is starting back up. Kids are starting back up. It's going to be incredible. And hey, if this is your first or second time here, we're so glad. We really do believe here at the Heights, you're here for a purpose and you're here for a reason. And we want to connect with you. And the easiest way for us to do that is by filling out the new here card and the seat back in front of you. And then you can take that over to Guest Central. We want to welcome you to our family and bless you with a free gift as a way to say thank you for joining us. Well, we're continuing our series called Alone. It is not good. It is not good to be alone. And we're talking about groups this morning. Pastor Barry did an incredible job kicking off this series. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. He did incredible talking about how we should not be alone because this Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. We were created to be in community with each other. You know, I really like to read a Proverbs every single day. There are 31 Proverbs. And so whatever day that is, if it's the second day, then you go to Proverbs 2 and so on and so forth. And I love doing that each and every month. And a couple of days ago, I read Proverbs 18 and verse 1. And I don't think they'll have that. I just saw it the other day. It says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. And so when we are isolating ourselves because, man, so many studies have come out that this day and age, we are more alone than ever before, which is crazy to think about because we have technology that connects us like never before. I mean, jobs are going remote. You can zoom in with somebody in real time in Africa. I mean, it's crazy how well connected we are, but we're still lonely, we're still lonely. I love in Hebrews, it says, do not forsake the coming together as some are in the habit of doing. So technology is great. I mean, if you don't feel well, you can watch church from the comfort of your own home, which is incredible. But don't forsake the assembling of ourselves. Because even though we can connect with someone, how many of you know it's different when you get to see someone face to face? Like it's different when you get to come together and just lay hands on each other. Like it's different in person than it is online. Like, yes, you can still pray. And yes, the Lord moves through technology and he moves and he is omniscient. But there's something about coming together, being a part of a community that prays for each other, that fights for one another and does not give up on each other. Like if you look all throughout scripture, we see examples of either groups or we see examples of two people like group ministry is in the DNA of Christianity. And you can see that uh, Moses, Moses was a friend of God. Moses spoke with God face to face, but Moses never did anything alone. Moses had Aaron, Moses had Miriam. As a matter of fact, if you read in Exodus, all the people that had their problems, they came to Moses one by one. And that is millions of people would speak to Moses and say, hey, you need to help me solve this. You need to speak to the Lord on my behalf. And one person by one person, eventually Moses' father-in-law was like, hey, listen, this is not good. This is too much time. You need to appoint judges. You need to appoint a community that you trust to help you with this task. If you look at King David, before he was king, he had Jonathan. When he was on the run from Saul, he had his mighty men, but he also had Jonathan who was there to fight with him, to fight for him, to let him know if it was safe to come back or, you know what, you need to keep running. Don't come back here. He had somebody to help him. If you look at Elijah, Elijah had Elisha. 
Elijah chose, Elijah chose Elisha. Man, I'm going to get those mixed up. I apologize. Elijah told Elisha, hey, I need you to do this with me. The Lord has called you out. The Lord has asked you, and I'm going to show you what I do. They did group ministry together. Paul, on the road to Damascus, when he was blinded, the Lord sent him to Ananias. He was like, hey, this guy will pray for you for three days until you can go out and do what I have called you to do. And of course, the greatest example of all of group ministry, Jesus Christ did not do ministry by himself. I mean, he could have. Like, he really could have. In Colossians 2, verse 9, it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human life body. So Christ was fully God and he was fully man. He could do anything. He had all authority on earth, yet he chose, yet he chose to use 12 imperfect young men to change the world. He chose 12 imperfect young men to change the world. Christ did not do anything alone. He chose to hand select a community to be around him and forever change the earth. And today, we're going to be zooming in on the actions of one small group. We're going to be talking about one small group. Now, in Scripture, it doesn't call this group friends. It doesn't call them a small group. But their actions deem that they are friends, that they are a small group, that they deeply care for one of their own. But before we get there, I'm going to go ahead and pray. So dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are in this place. Lord, we open our hearts and we open our minds to what you have to say this morning. May my words be few and your words grow. May you be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Like I said, the Bible does not call these This group, these guys, that does not call them a small group, but I like to call them a small group. And the story is found in two places in the Bible. It's found in Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 17. But we're going to be focusing on Mark's account of this story in Mark's gospel. So we'll be in the gospel according to Mark, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says this, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed that visitors that were there was no room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat, right down in front of Jesus. So can you imagine a place being so packed you can't even push past people to get through? I mean, that's what Jesus does. Anytime that Jesus shows up, it should be like that. It should be so crowded that people can't push past because Jesus is in the room and Jesus is in this room this morning. They could not get the door. They had to literally tear the roof off. They had to tear the roof off, which if you are taking notes this morning, that's the title of today's message, Tear the Roof Off. Because can I tell you, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity every single day that we wake up to serve the kingdom, but we have an opportunity in small group during this semester to do something for the Lord to do something incredible this semester. In in the youth, we have something incredible to do. In kids, we have something incredible to do in small groups this semester. We have the opportunity to see our communities houses of lies, houses of trials, houses of addiction, go up on the roof, tear that roof off and say, this is Jesus. It's time to do that for each other, church. It is time to tear the roof off. There are three observations I want to make about this story, this this small group, this group of friends. And my first observation is this. 
friends deeply care. Like random people don't just go tearing off the roof for anybody. I mean, these friends cared for their friend. I mean, they, they took him on a mat. I'm sure that they had better things that they could be doing that day. I'm sure they could be watching the game, which of course it was the Cowboys. Maybe they didn't want to watch anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, in Texas, I feel like you always got to say something about the Cowboys. But, <laughs> but they could have been watching the game. They could have been spending time with their friends and family. They could have been doing something else, yet they dropped everything, put their friend on a mat, carried him over to Jesus, and that wasn't enough. They went up to the roof, and they tore the roof off and said, no matter what happens, we are going to get you to Jesus because that's where you need to be. They deeply cared for their friend. I love what Jesus says in John chapter 5 and verse 13. The message translation says it like this. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. They did whatever it took to get to Jesus. They deeply cared. And what that looks like with our small groups, what that could look like with our communities is, man, when somebody needs to be prayed over, and I am so, so guilty of this. I am preaching to myself too. Oftentimes someone's like, hey, can you pray with me about this? I'm like, yeah, I'll put in my prayer journal. I'll take it home. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you know throughout the week I'm gonna pray for you. No, maybe we need to stop what we're doing and stop going on with the rest of our lives and said, no, Jesus is right here, right now. I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to conquer this together. It's time to have, we have such busy lives, but it's time to live in the moment. I mean, if you look at Jesus, he had the most busy life ever, I feel like. He was here for an enormous purpose. And if you read in Mark so many times, it says immediately he went there, immediately he did that, immediately he did this. It, it was miracle after miracle after miracle. And John, the way he ends his gospel, he says if all the miracles that Jesus ever did were recorded, there would not be enough books in all the world to contain it. So Jesus was so busy, yet Jesus lived in the moment. Anytime anybody ever needed Jesus, he stopped what he was doing. I mean, blind Bartimaeus, he was on his way to Jerusalem. He was about to make his triumphal entry. This was the last week of Jesus' life, yet he stopped. And he said, you're healed. That's how we need to live our life in our small group. We need to stop and say, hey, we're going to agree with you. We're going to speak the name of Jesus because in Matthew 18, verse 20, Jesus himself says, if two or three of you are gathered in my name, I am among you. I am among you. So we need to stop, deeply care for others, stop what we're doing, stop with the busyness and say, I'm going to pray for you right now. You are not about to leave the same way that you started talking to me. Because that's what Jesus does. One touch of Jesus fixes a lifetime of brokenness. One touch of Jesus fixes a lifetime of shame and regret. They dropped everything that they were doing. It could also look like, man, calling people out in a loving manner of their sins and addictions. Like, man, if they know the truth and they're heading down this path, like, get alongside them. Like, listen, you know where your life is headed. I love you too much. I care too much to see you do this anymore. I am here to remind you of the truth, remind you that you actually are set free and you don't have to be a slave to whatever it is you're facing anymore. We have to show people that we really care about them. And not only did they deeply care, but my second point this morning is this, friends don't quit. Friends don't, a small group, a community does not quit. If you look back at Mark chapter 2, I mean, they came up to a huge roadblock. 
There were so many people crowded that house. They couldn't even get past the door. They couldn't even say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, I'm trying to get to Jesus. No, they had to go up to the roof and tear the roof off. What if that's how we were? What if we did not quit on our friends? What if we did not quit on our family? Like they did not stop until they got their friend to Jesus. So many times I am, again, guilty of this where, and I've been on both ends, where I've had someone come to me and say, man, I'm not worth it. I'm, I'm terrible at what I'm doing. Like, I'm just going to be a slave to whatever this is for the rest of my life. Like, I just, I just can't seem to get past it. Anytime I try to, it doesn't work. And then I've also said that to somebody else. And anytime someone has said that to me, I speak scripture. I said, no, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And you believe, you've accepted, you are free. And then at the end of that conversation, sometimes it's, yeah, that's great. I appreciate it. You can go ahead and pray for me. Um, I, guess, I guess I'll move on to the next person. I mean, I don't, and it's just so defeating. And so many times I'm like, you know what? I've spent, I don't know, 30, 40, an hour of my life trying to get through to you, trying to let you know how Christ sees you. If you don't want to accept my life, forget it. If you don't want to accept what I have to say in the truth, just forget about it. You know, I'll say a prayer over you or, or, or whatever, but man, if, if you're not going to listen to me, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I've done that before. But what if, what if we didn't give up? What if instead we said, I know you constantly say this about yourself, but every time you tell me, I'm going to tell you who you are. I'm going to tell you who you are in Jesus' name. And you know what? I'm never going to stop praying for you. Never going to stop praying for you because when we pray, things happen. When we pray, heaven and earth move. When we pray, something happens in the supernatural that affects the natural. So what if we did not give up? What if... No matter how many times that person came up to us, or no matter how many times that we went up to somebody else, we did not give up. What would that look like? What changes would happen? And this leads to my final observation this morning, is that friends, small groups, and communities point you to Jesus. They point you to to Jesus. I mean, honestly, that's what it's all about. Amen? That's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. And can I give you some real hard truth? If you have friends who you say, man, I I'm dealing with this. I'm so stressed out at work. I can't handle my boss anymore. School is getting to me. These kids, my friends, they just, I, I can't hang out. I can't understand them. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Like my marriage is on the rocks. My financial situation, I just can't see past it. If you have friends that say, hey, let's just numb ourselves, whatever that looks like. Let's just numb ourselves. Let's just go get drunk. Let's just, let's just go, let's just go do this. Let's go do that. Let's, let's just numb ourselves and not think for an entire day, let's go to this party, let's do something else that gets our mind off of these problems. If you have friends like that, you need new friends. You need friends that point you to Jesus because can I tell you, I've done this before. If you numb yourself, it feels great for a moment. Like it feels fantastic for a moment, but that problem, that trial, your marriage, your financial worries, your school trouble, whatever it is that's bumming you out, is still going to be there. No matter how much you self-medicate, it will still be there. And actually, it will be even worse after you come out of the numbing phase. It will be even worse on the other side. But if you have a community, if you have a small group that points you to Jesus, he fixes all of it. 
He heals all of it. You're, you might not see your situation change, but now you have the strength to continue. But now you have a new perspective of the situation that you are going through that you did not have before. Like Jesus is where the peace is. Jesus is where the joy that makes no sense is. That's who Jesus is. These friends deeply cared. They did not stop until their friend was at the feet of Jesus. And if we pick the story back up in Mark chapter 2, we see what, we see what happens when you're at the feet of Jesus. And we're going to pick back up in verse 5. And Mark 2 verse 5, it says this, Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Jesus changes everything. One touch of Jesus fixes a lifetime of brokenness, fixes a lifetime of hurting, fixes a lifetime of shame and regret, fixes a lifetime of darkness. Looking back at this small group, these friends, they got a little bit more than they bargained for when they brought their friend to Jesus. I mean, think about it. When you look, they saw that their friend couldn't walk. He was paralyzed. I said, okay, Jesus can heal him and he's going to start walking. We just need to get him to Jesus. But if you notice Jesus' first response, he didn't say, you're healed, get up and walk out of here. He said, your sins are forgiven. That's weird, right? Like whenever I read that, initially, I want to think, Jesus, like, this dude needs to walk. Like, I think his sins might be the last thing on his mind. I don't, I don't know, but hello, like, this guy is paralyzed. He needs to walk out of here. Like, that's what he's coming to you for. But that's what happens when you seek Jesus as a group and as a community. Like, Jesus sees the root of what's going on. Jesus heals you completely. It's not just the physical, it's not just in the natural, but Jesus peers through and looks at the supernatural and says, hey, I see that darkness that you're not telling anybody else. I see that darkness that you have surrounding you. I'm calling that out. My light is outshining that darkness. That's what happens when we carry each other to Jesus. There is no part of our life that is left untouched. There's no part of our life that is not changed when Jesus enters the room. There's no part in our life that will remain the same if we seek after Jesus. And church, that's the opportunity that we have during small groups is to be forever changed and is to be the change for somebody else because maybe somebody needs to see you be different. Maybe somebody else needs to see you, everything that you've gone through, and now you're a totally different person. You're like, dude, how are you different? Like, what happened? The last time I saw you, there was no way you would ever step foot inside a church, and now you're here? And now you're serving? Like, what's going on? Maybe somebody needs to see you be that and be that change. And I love Jesus' response. Because the religious teachers of the law, they're like, only God 
can forgive sins. Only God can do that. But if you remember, we read in Colossians 2, 9, that Jesus is the fullness of God in human form. And so Jesus, man, if there were ever any moments of mic drops in the history of ever, it would be during Jesus' ministry. Be during Jesus' ministry because Jesus says, so that you know that the Son of Man has all authority to forgive sins. And then he turns to the man and says, pick up your mat and walk. Mic drop. Like, that's it. That's all Jesus needs to say. But that's why, as a community, we need to strive to push and spur each other on towards Jesus because he has all authority. He has all authority. And if, if you are part of a small group, if you are part of a community, if you have friends that aren't doing that, get new friends. Get a, surround yourself with the community. This Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. We can't do it alone. We just can't do it alone. We need somebody to pray over us. We need someone to stand in the gap with us when life gets hard. I love the story of Moses when the Israelites are battling um, the descendants of Anak. And as long as he kept his hands up, they were going to win the battle. But then he started getting tired. Like we get tired. We get weary. When the enemy is just coming and just won't stop, we get so tired. But he had Aaron and Miriam on either side to help him hold his hands up. We need people here that help, help us hold our hands up. These friends, all they wanted to do was get their friend to Jesus. That's it. And I'll close with this. They expected a total healing. Cherry, go ahead and come on up. They expected a total healing, and that's what you get with Jesus. And church, this is what we do. This is who we are in small groups in a community. We're there to lock each other's arms, like look around you. Look at people to your right and to your left. This is your community. This is your community. This is your community. These are the people you do life with. These are the people who care deeply about you and people who will not quit till you see Jesus, until they help carry you to Jesus. I love what Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another, another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And Christ's law is love. Have the prayer team go ahead and come on forward. Christ's law is love. And so I love what Pastor Stephen says. He says, many hands make a light load. And that includes the burdens that we have. That includes the burdens that we have. It's time for us to find a small group if you are not a part of a small group already. And you can visit our friends at Guest Central. They will help you get plugged in to a small group. But it's time to get plugged in. It's time to stop living this life alone. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. If you have prayer of any kind, we are here. We will pray for you. The last thing I want to end with is, is this, the story of Shadrach Meshach and Abednego, this is another small group that you can see in the scripture. And if it was just Shadrach, it was just Meshach, if it was just Abednego, I don't know if they would be able to stand against King Nebuchadnezzar. But it was when all three of them were together and they were thrown, they defied a king they were thrown in a fiery furnace because they would not bow down to anyone else but the Lord Almighty. And it says there was a fourth man in the fire with them that looked like the Son of God. Jesus was there with them. And they changed an entire kingdom. And that's what small groups can do. 
Not only is it for our benefit that we surround ourselves with a community, but it just so happens to change the region around us. That's what a small group can do. You go ahead and stand with me. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what you came in with. I don't know what you're about to go home to. But can I encourage you? Get somebody's number today. Like reach out to somebody today. Let them know how you're really doing because so many times, and this is me too, I've just said, oh yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Life's good. I'm just busy. That's all. Just pray for me that the madness subsides and I don't be real with people. But this is a safe place to be real. Like your community, your small groups, that's where you can be real. You don't have to carry this burden alone. You don't have to be tired by yourself. You don't have to be weary by yourself. If you just reach out and touch the person next to you, like we have a real opportunity. We have a real opportunity. You can link arms, you can hold hands, whatever it is, but you have a real opportunity here to live life differently during this next semester of small group, to see your life change and to see other people's lives changed. Because that's what it's all about. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you chose us to touch a region, that you chose us in this house at this specific time, at this specific date, to be there for each other. Soften our hearts. Give us the strength to carry someone else's burden with them. Help us be real to one another. God, we thank you. Thank you for this incredible opportunity to serve you as we live life with each other. As we live life with each other. I speak the name of Jesus over any small groups that are here, any future small groups that we have. Thank you, Lord. We surrender our burdens to you and ask that you bring people into our lives that we can minister to and that can help minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you could put out your hands in front of you, I'm gonna leave you with a blessing and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Church, I bless you in the name of Jesus that is above every other name. We are here. We will be here as long as it takes for you to get prayed over because where there are two or three gathered, Jesus is here. Have a blessed week, church.